Welcome garden friends. Thanks for taking a little bit of time away from your garden to come visit mine. Today we have a great project. I'm going to show you my hack for planting a strawberry pot. Show you what I think you should grow in a strawberry pot, but the hack is all about the watering. Now we're going to start off right here <laughs> to continue the summer of lily love with the one that started it all. For me and for many gardeners, this is called Stargazer. And not only is it beautiful, not only does it smell like heaven, it's super easy to grow and easy to find. So take a look at this, get this in your garden. You know, I've partnered for years with flowerbulbs.com. They don't sell bulbs, but we have a common interest in that we just want people to plant bulbs. You know, whether it's this kind of bulb, a fall planted bulb, plant some bulbs. And with something like this lily, we've talked about it already in the in summer, you can get them on sale as plants or bulbs. You could get them in the fall and plant them then, or you could even plant the bulbs in the spring will work. The cool thing is too, they come in all sorts of different colors, shapes, and sizes. So very easy plant to add to the garden. And this one here, even though it's blooming this well, does not get the sun that it loves. So it can grow in lots of different conditions. Now I have to show you another lily as we look around the garden and see what the progress has been. So check this out. This is one of the bulbs I learned about through flowerbulbs.com. It's a calla lily called Frozen Queen. And I just threw the bulbs into a container. And the thing about it is at the end of the season, it's tender. So I can either lift those bulbs and store them or I can grow it as a house plant. And I think that's what I'm gonna try. I just think those colors are amazing. Check out our dragon's tongue beans. They're sprouted and growing. It won't be long until we'll have bags of beans to give away to friends. We've been picking cucumbers every day. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so I have an experiment going here. I planted peas and usually I wait maybe another month to plant my peas, but oftentimes there's not enough time to harvest them. So I'm going to start them a little earlier. They hate hot weather, but we'll see what happens. And I've been getting a lot of messages from people who have been watching the videos. They're saying things like, well, we really love it because it just shows you don't have to have a pristine garden. I'm just like, thanks. <laughs> and that's what this is all about. Uh, I did a story years ago and a guy worked at a, a golf course. These were in Austin found for a year and then he used them in his garden as supports. And so that's what I'm doing. He brought me a bunch of them and I'm using them to support these peas. Well, you might think this is the craziest thing you've seen in a garden, but this is what I love about gardening. The garden's for you, not for anybody else. I love golf clubs in the garden, maybe not for you. <laughs> Part of gardening is trying to attract pollinators. So first off, this is an organic garden. No chemicals in here at all so that the pollinators are safe. But this is one of my favorite pollinator plants. It's called Tithonia torch or Mexican sunflower. It's a 1951 All-America selection. I talk about All-America selections a lot because when it has that AAS certification, you can't go wrong. And so this plant is so easy to grow. Put this on your list. Uh, you can start it from seed in the spring and it needs nothing from the gardener. And I had one last year that got 20 feet tall. I don't know how, I don't know why. It could be anywhere from six feet to 20 feet tall. It is an amazing plant that brings in the hummingbirds, the butterflies, and the bees. So this is called a strawberry pot. What is it good for? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Not for strawberries. If you've ever planted anything in here, when you water, just the water comes out of all these things. I have a good hack for that. And so it's this tube. This is just a PVC tube that I have drilled 3 8 inch holes in. I've capped off the bottom, just stuffed something in there, and then I'd put it in here and then put the soil in around it. It was nice that it just comes in and out. Now when I water, I will just put my hose right in here. It fills up and kind of comes out slowly. And I like succulents to be in these strawberry pots. And that's what we're gonna plant, a special one. This is called Gold Nugget. And I know what you're saying, it doesn't look gold to me. When it gets cold at the end of the season, it's gonna turn almost pure red. It's a very, very cool variety. And these are, you know, hens and chicks. They don't need anything from us. That's why they're perfect for this. And they look cool and there's nothing to planting this. You see how that came out of there. You just, we're just gonna stuff them in these holes. And I think we'll have enough actually to fill up all the holes. We'll see. 
then dig a little hole down in there. The soil that's in here has already been moistened. That's the way I like to do any container. Just kind of shove it down in there. Perfect. And you'll be surprised how they'll just come back from this. The most important job is going to be to clean up this tablecloth after we get done or I'll be in trouble. And then I'm going to put some of these caladiums on top and we'll talk about that in just a second. worked out perfect. I only have one left. And on top, this is a caladium called Heart to Heart from Proven Winners. They are nice because they take a little bit more sun than your normal caladium. And they're just going to be kind of squeezed in here at the top. I am making a mess. And we'll put some water on it. What do you think? I think that's gonna look cool. When these things all turn orange on the sides at the end of the season, I can't wait to show you that. All right, all I'm gonna do is put this last one in, get some water on it, we're done. These guys really rooted up nice. I might split these bulbs. I know there's three of them in here. All right, and that's all there is to it. Like I said, we'll water it and that'll be it. It's gonna look good. Now it's time for Talking Trees from the Davy Tree Expert Company. I'm joined by Rob Krueljack. He's an assistant district manager for the North Pittsburgh office of the Davy Tree Expert Company. And today we're talking all about managing our home forests here. Mm -hmm. I've got three well, one's a shrub, but the other two are trees. They're growing kind of close together. I, I want your opinion of it, but let's just talk about spacing of trees and managing that forest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any, like I said before, any tree is a good tree for its benefits to the environment. Um, but if you're trying to manage your woodlot and you have some trees that you may have planted or they're more of a, a, a specimen tree that's going to live, outlive you know, the, the second succession trees that come in after a, a land's been cleared, um, and you want to kind of protect those or let those thrive, then doing some management, some removal, some pruning to let those uh, more important trees in your, your landscape thrive is not a bad idea. Well, the one behind me is more important. It's a mm -hmm. heptacodium. It's kind of a tree shrub, but right above it is this kind of trashy maple. <laughs> yeah, Norway maple, uh, invasive, um, fast growing. Um, yeah, definitely crowding out uh, your shrub here. So removing that would be a, a recommendation I would make to you. All right, well, get rid of this. Mm -hmm. I think I can still move this because it's a little close to that Coosa dogwood. And then yeah. behind you, mm -hmm. a paper bark maple slow grower, right? Correct. But, uh, but one that will get up above the shrub eventually into that like middle story of the canopy. Is it okay to have it in here as an understory tree? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. It, Less sunlight, a little bit slower growth than usual, probably. Things been there ten years, and it's still pretty scrawny. <laughs> right, <laughs> I think. But I love it for that bark. You know, mm -hmm. I've always wanted a paper bark maple. Uh, found one on sale, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and off to the races, yeah, so to speak. Right. <laughs> uh, grape vines. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of grape vines here. I try to manage them, but not always. That's usually my winter job. Yeah, winter is a fine time to do it, but you know I would typically recommend the summer because that way you can go through and if you can recognize the leaf, when you cut it, you give it a few days. If you still see those leaves not wilted, you know you missed one. So you can go back through and kind of hunt that, that lone one down. Actually, a few weeks ago you showed me one that I didn't even realize was there. Mm -hmm. 
was this thick, yeah. I definitely cut that thing. And you can see on the top, they're gone. Let's take a look at these trees because I do have an, another problem in that Coosa dogwood. I want your opinion. Okay. See, I love this because I get all this work done and I get an expert to tell me how to do the work. Although you should be doing the work. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so wrong place for a Coosa dogwood? Not necessarily. I mean, okay. it can tolerate this type of uh, planting. It's only bloomed about twice in five years. That, that's probably one of the downsides of being a little bit uh, shaded out like this. So a branch from somewhere came down and this is, even I know this is bad. Yeah, it, it's a shame that, you know, it, it tore some of your wood fibers here. Um, typically we wanna make every branch cut that we remove right at the branch collar at the branch bark ridge. Um, Unfortunately, this, that has been removed with this tear. So the best we can do at this point is uh, we'll go ahead and cut you know, through, through this and then see about cleaning it up. From the bottom up? Yeah, I would go from the bottom up. I'll go ahead and step away All while right. you can make that cut because you have your safety gear on. Oh, that was easy. We'll take a look. Does this look all right? Yeah, actually, that's quite good. You can see some of the callus tissue that's already has been forming here. Um, unfortunately, this won't completely seal this wound over, but it could get rather close, like through the lifespan of the tree. Um, this new wound wood will start growing like a ram's horn, kind of in on itself. But you know, th those two sides can get rather close and help not completely seal it, but protect it more. Well, while we're here. You pointed out we've got mm -hmm. some different vines growing here, right? Yeah, a lot of when I'm on a, a client's property and show up, you know, I do often like to point out poison ivy and such uh, in different vines to the client while I'm there in case they don't know what it looks like. Uh, right here in your little uh, habitat, we have some poison ivy uh, with the three leaves. So that old adage of three leaves, let it be. You can't go wrong there. Um, the Virginia creeper is nearby it, but it has five leaves, safe. Uh, and then we have some English ivy mixed in as well. So um, going up your white oak here, you got some English ivy as well. It's not as uh, aggressive and fast growing as the others, so I'm not as concerned about that. But if you start to see uh, the English I or the, um, the, the poison ivy or the Virginia creeper getting up into the canopies, that's when I'd cut it at the base and just let it, uh, you know, die. I'm lucky that I am not highly allergic to poison ivy yet. Mm -hmm. You never know. You know, that can change. Correct. Talk a little bit about you, how careful you have to be. I have a friend that, that gets it really bad. Yeah. She has a whole set of tools and gloves and clothes only for working around poison ivy. Specific. Yeah. If you have a tendency to get it or, or get it bad, um, long sleeves, gloves. Uh, our guys at work sometimes, if they're, they know they're going to be in it all day, they'll, they'll tape their, their, their gloves to their, their shirts. Um, washing up immediately after your exposure. Uh, there's a couple different products on the market that can take the oils away, which are what really cause the, the damage to your skin. Um, it's kind of neat though, in, amongst your poison ivy, you also have the, the natural antidote for some of this The jewel sting. weed, which yep. that's interesting how nature does that. Jewel weed by the poison ivy. The if poison you get poison ivy. ivy, you use the jewel weed to help the, ease the symptoms. One of my friends up in Ligonier actually takes the jewel weed and blends it. And before he goes and works in his garden, wow. he'll apply it yeah. first. And he claims that that protects him. It's also good for stinging nettle as a, as a quick relief for stinging nettles. Well, I think I'm getting the hang of this. I actually made a decent cut here. Want to race me to the top of that oak? Sure. Let's go. <laughs> I think I know who'll win. Oh, thanks for coming. No problem. Anytime. Ouch. <laughs> Sorry. I, you're strong. I don't mean to. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That's how YouTube analytics work. I sure appreciate it. I'd love to hear what your favorite lily is or if you've ever planted in a strawberry pot. Until next week, keep planting, and we'll see you then.